When we talk about attribution, we're really talking about the fundamental soul of journalism. It's where we get our information. And without proper attribution or a complete attribution, we really don't have enough faith in the information that's being provided to us. The corollary in the writing that you're used to, more academic writing, are citations. So when you see endnotes or footnotes, when uh, there's some indication of where material has come from, that is the same as the attribution that we're providing in journalism. And just as academic papers really get no credibility if they do not have the sourcing that shows the expertise that's been pulled into those papers, the same thing applies here with the expertise that we need for these journalistic projects to show where these facts came from and why we should believe them. In these uh, journalistic projects that we create, it's important to remember that really the journalist's opinion doesn't mean anything to us. And I know that that sounds harsh and I don't mean it to, but the fact is, is that our job is to get the opinion of our sources, qualified sources, and we are to put those opinions in our stories. And those are the opinions that readers really care about and that we have the source of where that opinion came from. We all know what opinions are like. Everybody has one. So we have to make sure that we're getting qualified sources, people who can actually speak on the expertise of the topic at hand. The rule in journalism really is if you didn't see it, you need to attribute it. So that means that if you are uh, driving on the highway and you come upon a car that is flipped up on its roof on the side of the road um, and there's a woman who is standing by the car crying and holding a baby, you can't say that a woman who was driving a car with a baby in it was uh, on the road and flipped her car over. You need to have somebody in some authority say that to you. Uh, you know, the example that I give you here is even if you see a man jump off a fourth floor ledge, did he jump? Did he get pushed? Did he fall? We really don't know the information. So rather than us taking the chance of providing information incorrectly, get people who do know what the information is and quote them. So the goal of attribution is, is going to tell us a few things. Where did this information come from? Who exactly is this person who's providing the information? What is their expertise and why should we believe the information that they're giving us? And basically, how did you get the information? This is what it looks like. I've given you an example here on this page. Uh, NOLA, which is the online home of the Times-Picayune newspaper in New Orleans, uh, wrote a story recently about a high school football player named Matthew Tarto who was found dead in his home. And it was reported in the story that it was at his father's hand, and his father was also found dead. Now, that information came from police, and it came from officials on the scene. So the attribution I provided for you in these quotes, and you can see that I bolded qualified sources to provide the information. So this has all the earmarks of an apparent murder-suicide, and the autopsy supports that finding, said Colonel John Fortunato, spokesman for the sheriff's office. And then we get a quote from the Jefferson Parish coroner, who said it was difficult for the investigators to ascertain Tardo's exact time of death. Basically, there's two main types of sourcing. One is to provide the quote with attribution, and that means it's verbatim. It's exactly what your source said in exactly the order that they said it. And we are not allowed to change quotes in any way, the exception being we can remove what are called like verbal lubricants, so you know, like. Those are things that we can take out, but the quote itself really needs to maintain its integrity and its context. So the example that I've given you here is this quote from John Fortunato that this has all the earmarks of an apparent murder-suicide and the autopsy supports that finding. That is a real quote in real time. Now the difference is to be able to paraphrase with attribution. And paraphrasing basically says we're going to take the general idea of what the source said, but we're not going to use every single word verbatim like it came out of their mouth. And we're not going to necessarily put it in the order. But we are going to maintain the continuity. We're going to maintain the context of what they said. So if you have someone who goes on for a really long time with a quote and you only need to glean out a certain amount of information that's relatively small, paraphrase that information. If you're not sure what the quote was, you copied down the information, but you're not really sure one word or another, if you are not positive about what the quote is verbatim, then you're going to paraphrase that information. It's used to write a lot tighter, keeping in mind that the quotes are supposed to be really compelling. They're supposed to be a way that the story leaps forward in time. The rule that we go by is that we paraphrase facts and we support those facts with quotes. So think about your quote as a bridge through the story and the facts are the path through the story. So the path is going to be kind of winding and, and fairly straightforward, whereas a bridge is going to take you to a different 
place. It's going to make you leap forward. And that's our goal with these quotes, that it really makes you understand what the facts mean to you. So the example I've given you here is from Philly.com about a study that the U.S. is the only advanced economy that doesn't require paid vacations. Now over here on the left, we have the paraphrase facts. So when the report was released, who released it, what exactly it, it did. It compared these two dozen other countries with the U.S. and it talked about different facets of the U.S. economy. And then it supports those facts with this quote, relying on businesses to voluntarily provide paid leave just hasn't worked, said John Schmidt, senior economist and co-author of the report. So we see exactly who John Schmidt is and we see what his qualifications are. And that quote supports the facts that we've already been presented with. The way that we cite attribution in our stories is pretty standard and it's a rule that we need to follow. On first reference, the first time that you mention someone, use their first and last name. We don't use Mr. or Mrs. or anything like that. The New York Times has done that in New York Times style. In the Associated Press style that we use, we only use first and last names. We also give their title, and that can come either before the name or after the name. Longer titles almost always come after the name. Shorter titles might come before. Um, and you capitalize the title if it comes before the name, lowercase the title if it comes after. You'll also want to include any other important qualifiers that may be significant to us understanding why this person is a qualified source. On second reference, and that's any subsequent reference that you're going to have, we use last name only, the exception being if you have two people with the same last name, you can use first and last name repeatedly, or in that case, if they're married, you can use Mr. and Mrs., and then we add some additional details if we need them. If we don't need them, we don't have to add it, but that opportunity is available to us. So the rule is that we attribute once per paragraph, and that means that if you have a two-sentence paragraph and you put the attribution in the first sentence, you don't need to put attribution again in the second sentence if it's the same speaker. Now, if it's a different speaker, obviously we're going to need to know where the information came from, but in that case, you're probably going to want to break that into two paragraphs anyway. We use said or asked if we're dealing with a question. Uh, remember that journalistic writing is in past tense, so we, we use said, and it avoids having to kind of put in modifiers that we don't necessarily intend. So if you say that someone admitted something, that implies guilt, even though that may be not what you're trying to get across. So just use said and let the person's words speak for themselves. The same way we don't want to indicate information that we don't have. So we don't know what someone believes, or we don't know what they think or what they feel. What we do know is what they tell us. So the way that we cite in these articles is this person said they believe this, or they said they thought this, or they said they felt this. <laughs>